Thank you, Jeff. And I remind you to stop by the Dow AgriSciences building, or booth. They've got uh, several representatives, Scott Flynn, Pat Birch, and a number of them are there. So stop by and, and visit with that group. Uh, they've got a lot to offer. The topic that we're going to address today is one that several of you have requested for a number of years, and I just didn't have the nerve uh, to, to tackle it. And then last year, we decided on this topic before we left this convention. In fact, I talked to both speakers that will follow me before we left and asked them to do it. So uh, we, we've been thinking about it. But let me say up front, the topic that we're going to address today is somewhat confusing. The topic is certainly somewhat controversial. And we may disagree before we leave here this morning, but we're not going to be disagreeable. So we're going to try to learn as we go along, and we're going to talk about uh, several different things. I want to talk, off just, talk just a little bit as we open the conference up this morning and kind of put us, uh, get us a base to start with to kind of think about some things concerning the interest in and opportunities for grazing. If we look over, over that, those years, Jeff, since I've been coming to this, I've seen a tremendous increase in grazing, increase in interest in grazing, and just look at the program here today of uh, the number of papers and people who are going to be speaking on that. So as we talk about that, there's a lot of reason for this increase in interest. We just heard of some of those uh, reasons in the previous presentation in our opening, and you're going to hear about a whole lot more before the session's over. But I would say that one reason that I've always been interested in, in, in grazing raising is strictly from an economic standpoint. When we think about that, and there may be some exceptions to this, but at present I don't know of many, when we think about nutrients during the growing season of going into our ruminant animals, then we think about those nutrients and the cost. And in general, the nutrients from grazed pasture are the cheapest that we put in our ruminant animals. Now if we think about that, and then if we look at where we're at today, and indeed much of the eastern United States, and we think about profitability in the beef cattle operation, I don't know how it is on your farm, but when I look at the big picture, it's very easy for me to conclude that one of the single best predictors of profitability has to do with how much stored feed we have to have to get our animals through the winter. So if we combine both of those things and we think about a goal, we very easily could say less optimized in 2017 the amount of nutrients, the number of days that we can meet those needs through grazed pasture and minimize the number of days that we have to use any kind of purchased or stored feed, which is usually more expensive. We can do that in a number of ways. We certainly, a way that has been discovered and rediscovered over the last two decades is the fact we can use more of what we grow. Think about how much we waste and how much we could use. If we can simply use more and waste less, we will certainly meet one of those goals. If we use it with our grazing management in a higher quality state, that's another goal. And if we use it over more days of the year, that's certainly another major goal. All of those can benefit us in many different ways. Now when we think about this, Don Ball and I were in New Zealand over 30 years ago for our first time, and we were on the South Island in New Zealand on a farm. And we were there, and a farmer told us this statement. And we both made note of it that day, but I, honestly, it didn't resonate with me nearly as much as it has year after year after year. And I still believe this, more so today than I did when that farmer told us there over 30 years ago, every day, that we can meet those nutritional needs from the better quality, cheaper feed, the more money we're going to make at the end of the year. So I believe that, and that will be the premise. Now, I told you two years ago, those of you that were here, I did something over the Christmas holidays I'd never done before. I inventoried my toolbox. Now, I've got two toolboxes. I've got a nice Craftsman toolbox in the garage that pretty much is off limits to most people who visit, including my grandchildren. I have a loaner toolbox that you see in the picture. That one is available to all my neighbors. They can come and get anything out of it that they want any time. My grandchildren can go get in it, so that one is pretty much free. But over the Christmas holidays, I got that toolbox out, and I went out and inventoried it. I just looked at everything in there. Got it out and put it in nice little piles, and first, you'll notice, there's not a good tool in the whole one, but. <laughs> Second, you will notice that I've got all kinds of tools in that toolbox some of which I didn't know where they came from, and some I didn't really know what they were, what they were used for. But I had them in there. I know you're first counting them up and say, why would anyone need 24 screwdrivers? <laughs> well, I, I can't answer that, but they showed up anyway. Now I have those tools, and when I've got a job to do, I'll select a tool out of that toolbox to do it. 
If I'm going to drive a nail, I usually don't select a screwdriver. Likewise, if I'm going to unscrew a Phillips screw, I don't select a hatchet. So I use those tools for specific purposes, and I use them all over a run of a year. So I want to keep that in mind as we go, go through. And then I want you to think about your grazer's toolbox. Think of all the tools that you as a grazer have. And think of how many you have added to your toolbox in the last decade, in the last two decades. Think about all the tools that you've added from the standpoint of fencing. All the tools available today from watering. All the tools from the standpoint of genetics. New varieties, grazing tolerant varieties. All the different things that's available in that toolbox that you didn't have a decade ago, that you didn't have two, two decades ago. And we continue to make that toolbox bigger and bigger, but yet, it's a toolbox, and you as a grazer have to select the tools out of there. Now, you get a lot of educational materials. There's lots of good publications. There's lots of good research that's been done. And all of those will help you with instruction manuals on how to operate those tools, how to best use those tools. But yet, they are still tools in your toolbox. One of the important tools in that toolbox, and it is a tool, it's not the toolbox, is grazing method. The grazing method you select or methods over the run of the year is a critically important tool in your toolbox. Now just like in my toolbox, I've got many different screwdrivers, but they're still screwdrivers. So I can select from a lot of different screwdrivers. Same thing with the grazing method. I've got a lot of grazing methods to select from. We're going to discuss some of those. But especially with the topic at hand, one of the things that oftentimes gets confused is the two terms of stocking rates and stocking density. And they shouldn't be. They've been well defined. Every one of us has talked about them for years. But yet, we see those terms oftentimes misused when it comes to some type of high density grazing. Now, let me just basically go back and review. But when we talk about stocking rates, we're talking about the number of animals or number of animal units or amount of body weight over a particular area to be grazed over time. So we usually think of it over the acres over a year's period. Now if we look at that and look at that plot down there that Dennis has outlined for us, let's just assume that's a 100 acre field. That's what we're going to have to graze. And let's assume that when grass greens up, we turn 100 head of cattle out on that. So we got 100 head on 100 acres. That is one cow per acre. Now let's assume that every cow in that field weighs 1,000 pounds. So we've got one cow per acre or 1,000 pounds per acre grazing. So now let's take another term and think about stocking density. Stocking density differs in that it refers to the number of animals or the weight of the animals or animal units on a particular area at a point in time. So now if we take that same 100 acres and take that same 100 cows, but yet we don't let them have access to the 100 acres today, we put them right down in an acre in the corner of that pasture. Now, we've still got 100 cows, but now we have them at a point in time, the density, we've got them all on an acre. So we've got 100 cows per acre. And again, if we assume they're 1,000 pound cows, we have 100,000 pounds of beef per acre on there. So therefore, keep those in mind, and, and uh, unless defined differently, we're going to keep some things rather simple today. And here, we want to think about a lot of different grazing methods that you and I can select from. I'm not going to take the time to define these. Uh, go to the Southern Forage books. There's lots of definition in there. There's a whole international book that's been published on terminology for grazing lands and grazing animals, put together under the leadership of Dr. Vivian Allen, who will join us here tomorrow. But there's the ones that when we think about mob grazing, we think about high-density grazing, and we think about ultra-high-density grazing. Tremendous amount of confusion. If you want to define those and go to the literature, be prepared for a rough ride because it's extremely confusing. We just use them interchangeably. So we're going to give a definition uh, at the end today that we're going to work on and then modify. I was in a conference last week uh, in Illinois, and a gentleman was talking about uh, high-density grazing, and he said that high-density grazing for him was 200,000 pounds per acre, and ultra-high-density was somewhere between a half a million and a million pounds per acre. Now, my tiny little brain can't comprehend getting a million or two million head uh, on an acre, but uh, anyway, that's, that's what he was talking about, so we'll talk about that. So basically, where I'm talking about my little loner toolbox, or we're talking about the largest grazing operation in this room, 
We've all got management tools. That's why we're the managers. And our challenge is to use those management tools. We want to select the right tool. We want to use it wisely. We want to use it efficiently. And we want to use it at the right time. Now, the tool that we're talking about today is mob grazing. And for the sake of, of our presentations, unless we further define it, we're going to call mob grazing and high-density grazing and ultra-high-density grazing to mean greater than 100,000 pounds per acre for a short duration, and we will define some of the shorts and longs, usually less than a day, and a longer rest period. So let's not let ourselves get bogged down with those. And if you have an official definition right out of Webster's or right out of the terminology handbook, we will consider that at the end. Now, we've got a lot to talk about. And we, uh, we've got people who are going to talk to us about the best knowledge that we have today. And I selected both of these people last year in Louisiana to talk about it because I knew we needed key people to talk about it. And then I knew that our first speaker was getting ready to head back to New Zealand. I knew he was going to talk to a lot of grazers, not only in New Zealand, but across the country. I knew he had had a lot of experience. And he's a person that I, I'm very proud of. He's a person that I take uh, some credit for some of his training. And so far throughout his career, he's exceeded everything that's been asked of him. Now today may be one of his greatest tests because he's got more slides than I ever try to present in that length of time. Join me in welcoming to talk about mob grazing, factor friction, Dr. Dennis Hancock.